today, I would like to give the word to uh, Carlo Patti. Um, wait. Uh, I want to introduce him first. So Carlo is a professor of international relations at the Federal University of Goya in Brazil, where I guess most of you are also located at right now. Um, he coordinates the graduate program in political science. He received his PhD in history and international relations from the University of Florence in 2012. His research focuses on Brazil's foreign policy, Brazil's nuclear history, international history, nuclear diplomacy, and international security. In 2015, uh, the British Academy awarded him with the Newton Advanced Fellowship. He, he published O Programa Nuclear Brasileiro Uma Historia Oral. Um, in, sorry for that, um, the Brazilian nuclear program and oral, oral history, as well as articles in uh, Revista Basileira de Politica Internacional, International Historical Review, Cold War History, Journal of Cold War Studies, Il Politico, Limes, and Mediano, so quite impressive the number of journals you published in, Carlo, congratulations, and uh, he's the author of Brazil in the Global Nuclear Order, 1945 until 2018, which we're here to listen about today, will be published in December by John Hopkins University Press. And as I hear, Carlo has uh, coupons for reduced prices, which I'm sure he will share with us later. Uh, and I'll forward. And now, Carlo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pascal. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yoko Ibama, for uh, giving me the opportunity to present my book for the first time after the announcement of the, of the forthcoming uh, publication. So, uh, I will share my uh, my presentation of uh, I think okay I think now I'm sharing it and uh, this book uh, is uh, the fruit it deals with uh, Brazil's uh, role in the global nuclear order in the uh, since the beginning of the nuclear age in 1945 until. 2018, when uh, actually I finished to, to write uh, my book. And uh, it's the fruit of my doctoral and postdoctoral research. Uh, so uh, this research lasted uh, uh, 12, 12 to 13 years, actually, uh, since my, the beginning of my PhD at the University of Florence. Uh, so I think uh, uh, my research uh, and the uh, research group I, I belong to the Nuclear Proliferation International History Project and also the research project here in Brazil. Uh, it overlaps with, uh, uh, with Professor uh, Ivama's uh, uh, research. I mean, it's the same kind of question that uh, all this research group on in the International History of Nuclear Energy or Nuclear Dipl Diplomacy uh, presented in that, uh, in that moment, you know, in, the, in, the, in the late 2000s when uh, we were trying to understand the, uh, if it was possible to do a global history also of nuclear non-proliferation, or if we had to continue to focus just uh, on the United States, Soviet Union, and few other states for understanding how the international, the global nuclear order was uh, shaped. So this book uh, has the ambition to clarify several points from the perspective of a large country from the global south and with uh, a consistent history in the in the nuclear field and also in the in the nuclear diplomacy as uh, uh, i will i would like to show in this uh, in this book so thank you very much again for giving me the opportunity to to present uh, my research and my my main findings uh, thank you again this book relies uh, on a uh, multi-archival research in uh, eight different countries and uh, in oral history interviews, uh, uh, Pascal mentioned a book I published a few years ago, uh, the history of the, the oh, an oral history of the nuclear program. And uh, some of those interviews are the basis of uh, several, of uh, a part of the narrative I presented in the book. And of course, I relied also on the literature that uh, uh, didn't include, of course, all the documentation that has been declassified over the last uh, 15 years in all the countries like Argentina, above all Brazil, but also France, South Africa, United Kingdom, United States, and West Germany. That are the countries with, uh, that were related, of course, with uh, uh, the evolution and development of the Brazilian nuclear program, but were not only these, those countries that were, that were relevant. 
And my interviews have been with uh, protagonists of the Brazilian nuclear program, but also of the US nuclear diplomacy. So scientists, diplomats, politicians, and military officials since Brazil lived under a period of military regime since between 1960, from 1964 to 1985, but also because several uh, aspects of, uh, of the nuclear program also with uh, for civilian purposes uh, were led in, uh, were made in uh, civilian in military research centers. So the main issues of, uh, of this book throughout all this, uh, this material, I try to understand uh, Brazil's quest for nuclear autonomy, or better, but, better uh, saying, how Brazil uh, tried to to reach autonomy in the nuclear field and to master the nuclear fuel cycle from uh, the mining from mining, since Brazil has uh, uh, large resources of uh, uranium ore, but above all of uh, of thorium, and. Uh, also understanding why Brazil doesn't have a nuclear bomb, and if there was a possibility in the past to develop such, uh, such a device. And also, I would like to shed light also on Brazil's attitude towards the regime of, of nuclear non-proliferation, not only uh, during the, the establishment, the negotiation of the NPT, but also since uh, the beginning of the talks about nuclear non-proliferation or non-dissemination that were the talks that began in 1940-46. And then the book, uh, above all, the, the last chapter deals with uh, the current uh, stance of Brazil in the nuclear global order and uh, also for understanding what are the current projects of, uh, of, nuclear, of nuclear Brazil. The first issue and the first finding in this uh, uh, very long research has been uh, finding uh, documentation that testifies that since uh, the 50s, but we can say also since 1946, actually, when the first gathering happened for discuss discussing the setting up of a Brazilian nuclear program, the goal has been uh, achieving the mastering of the nuclear fuel cycle. This was the, the, the goal that Brazil, or Brazil scientists and some politicians um, projected had in, the, in their minds uh, in the late 40s when they set up the first nuclear projects. But uh, it's also this, the, the same, the very same goal today if we compare, of course, these two, these two documents I'm showing. The first one, is, the doc, is a document from the archive of the father of the Brazilian nuclear program, when it showed all the phases in a very nice way, all the phases of the nuclear full cycle. And the other image is an official image from the Brazilian Navy that shows also all the stages of the nuclear full cycle and uh, uh, several stages are mastered and uh, under the control, the command of uh, on the Brazilian Navy right now. So um, how Brazil did seek nuclear autonomy? Uh, was Brazil able to cooperate with uh, the traditional allies of the traditional partners considering uh, the geographical position and the, the history of Brazil that uh, was in the sphere of the influence of the United States? Uh, did Brazil had, had, uh, have the uh, need to cooperate with other with other partners. Brazil was a very important partner for the United States in providing nuclear minerals since uh, at least 1942, and uh, especially starting uh, from 1945, February to July 1945, when Brazil supplied uh, monazite sands that were a material, that are a material uh, that can, uh, from which it's possible to extract thorium that's uh, of course usable for uh, producing plutonium. And uh, in this uh, picture of, from 1951, we see the moment of an agreement with the United States that after the first opening uh, from the secrecy imposed by the first uh, US Atomic Energy Act of 1946, if I'm, if I'm right, uh, the United States were open to collaborate with other countries. And Brazil was a country that could collaborate with, uh, with the United States. But the, 
several times Brazil wanted more than uh, the United States could, uh, uh, could export. The United States restricted, of course, the transfer of technologies, knowledge, and materials to other countries. Despite Brazil was also a partner in the Atoms for Peace program. But at the very beginning, since 1951, in several occasions, during the 50s, during, during the 40s, during the 50s, and above all, during the 70s, after several openings from the United States, uh, Brazil needed to find another partner because the United States uh, uh, didn't want to provide Brazil with. Uh, sensitive technologies that could give Brazil the opportunity to master the nuclear fuel cycle. So in all those opportunities during the 50s, during the 70s, and also during the 80s, we can say, Brazil found other partners. Uh, probably the most famous partners, above all for understanding the global nuclear order of the 70s was with Germany. The, but the, it was not the first time that uh, West Germany and other countries cooperated with Brazil. Uh, West German research centers, as my study demonstrated, uh, provided Brazil with uh, sensitive nuclear te technologies in the early 50s. And uh, US policies uh, tried to block the export of those uh, technologies to Brazil. Uh, the same happened uh, to France, both uh, in, in several occasions during the 50s. During the 60s, Brazil was, uh, France was uh, the main partner for the possible Brazil's nuclear projects. But of course, everybody probably involved in the, uh, in the study of, uh, uh, of, the, of nuclear energy and the nuclear proliferation remember that uh, one of the main threats of the, of the considered main threats uh, to the global nuclear order and to the stability of the NPT a few years after its signature and uh, its entry into force in 1970 was uh, a large uh, nuclear agreement between uh, uh, West Germany and Brazil when West Germany uh, committed to transfer to Brazil the whole nuclear fuel cycle, even if uh, under international safeguards, uh, and the supervision of the International Atomic Energy Agency. And of course, uh, it would provide also reactors to, 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 to Brazil for giving the opportunity to Brazil to expand its, uh, its nuclear sector and to create a nuclear, a nuclear industry. But uh, it's also important uh, to think that uh, there was a second strategy because we're thinking about the cooperation of Brazil with West Germany that when West Germany during the 70s became one of the main actors in the so-called nuclear suppliers group that was uh, a, a group created after the Indian nuclear peaceful nuclear explosion of 1974 and uh, this group uh, was uh, committed to create a, a common set of rules for constrain or, for, or to limit the export of sensitive nuclear technologies and avoiding new smiling Buddhas around the world uh, and above all in uh, countries that could threaten the, the global nuclear order. Countries like Brazil that were uh, opposing the, the global nuclear order since they were not signatories of, uh, uh, of the NPT. So in, those, in this way, and uh, I have not an appropriate slide, but uh, I would like to tell what was a possible alternative to uh, uh, further restrictions also posed by, by countries like uh, West Germany, was uh, trying to circumvent non-proliferation rules. And uh, it's above all important for the 60s and the 70s in Brazil's nuclear history because Brazil in several occasions started talks with countries that uh, couldn't officially uh, cooperate with Brazil in the field of sensitive technologies, but uh, were open to do that. And this is the case of Germany in 1968, when uh, while German, the German cabinet was discussing about the possible signature of the NPT, some members of the German cabinet, and I refer especially to Franz Josef Strauss, were discussing with Brazilian authorities of the possible export of a sensitive of a facility for enriching uranium in Brazil. The same thing happened in the case of Japan 
we have uh, several documents that uh, reveal talks between uh, Brazilian authorities and Japanese authorities for a top secret transfer of technologies from uh, Japan to Brazil in the field of uh, ultra centrifuge technologies for enriching uranium. Both initiatives failed in the, in the late 60s. It's not clear why, but there is another, also another episode that uh, explain how Brazil tried to circumvent and other countries also tried to circumvent non-proliferation rules. In the mid 70s, Brazil that was not very happy with the technology that the, the Germany were, was uh, uh, transferring to Brazil, that jet nozzle technology that was uh, an unproven technology for enriching uranium, uh, began discussion with uh, retired uh, West German scientists that uh, used to work for the Centec, that was the uh, West German branch of Urenco for setting up in Brazil a ultra centrifuge facility. So the Brazilian case also shows how a country that uh, doesn't want to um, accept the non-proliferation rules as they were imposed in Brazil's perspective by the northern countries and the world from the superpowers, they tried to obtain uh, the nuclear autonomy in other ways, in other possible ways. And this uh, led me to understand uh, how Brazil actually uh, tried to see uh, in other, the, other, the third way Brazil tried to seek autonomy, above all uh, from 1979, at least in 1990. Of course, as a country that was opposing the NPT and uh, facing uh, strict limitations uh, that were originated by a very restrictive uh, US non-proliferation norms that were imposed in 1978 with the US Nuclear Non-Proliferation Act of 1978, Brazil uh, sought new partners or sought to develop an indigenous nuclear program completely unsafeguarded. So Brazil tried to cooperate with countries uh, not belonging to the NPT or that didn't accept, had not accepted yet the NPT. And it was the case uh, of China, for instance, that cooperated with Brazil starting from uh, 1984 and that uh, provided Brazil without safeguards uh, of uh, uh, and rich uranium that was transferred from Brazil, uh, the um, UF, uh, UF6, the uranium hexafluoride was transferred to, to China, was enriched in China, and then was transferred back to Brazil. Uh, and uh, according also to some uh, West German estimates, intelligence estimates, uh, the Chinese were also available to provide uh, knowledge to uh, for the uh, for the possible technology for the possible plans of uh, to develop nuclear submarines. So this was one way. So Brazil cooperated with uh, China, cooperated with uh, Iraq, even if Iraq was party of the NPT, but was an ambiguous party as of the NPT, as we know. And it cooperated also with uh, its supposed rival, that was Argentina, for a major agreement of 1980. So all those agreements were uh, functional to reach autonomy since uh, Brazil was uh, facing problems also uh, uh, with uh, his uh, major agreement with West Germany of 1975. And the other way Brazil sought autonomy was uh, 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 reaching autonomy through an indigenous nuclear program. So in 1979, in March 1979, because of the deficiencies of the F4G Brazilian nuclear program, above all in the production of uranium hexafluoride, and uh, uh, of course for the deficiencies of the technology of uh, the jet nozzle that was to be provided of, or developed jointly with uh, the West Germans, Brazil decided to uh, set up an autonomous nuclear program in unsafeguarded research um, centers through the cooperation between civilian unsafeguarded research centers. The main one is the IPEN, the Institute of uh, Nuclear Energy Research uh, in uh, Sao Paulo, and uh, military 
the military forces. So the three military forces, the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army actually had research centers working on specific topics. For instance, the most known is the, the most known is the collaboration between uh, the civilian institute called IPAN and uh, the Brazilian Navy that led uh, between uh, 1982 to 1987 to master the uranium enrichment technology through the ultra centrifuge method that uh, uh, as according to the Brazilians is, uh, uh, is completely autonomous and there are rumors of possible cooperation in the, in the black market to achieve such uh, accomplishment. But there is no evidence of a possible, uh, about a possible external cooperation, collaboration in, uh, in that. And there were also projects from uh, other projects, the other project of the Navy, the uranium enrichment program was functional to the naval propulsion for the future construction of a nuclear submarine, and also project from the army for in the field of uh, natural uranium, among, among other things, and of the Air Force. And uh, the Air Force project is pro probably the project that was uh, we consider more dangerous, because uh, uh, the the last goal of the of the Air Force project was developing. A peaceful nuclear device that, uh, as uh, many critics know, uh, there is uh, no difference between a PE in the construction of a PE and uh, uh, in, a, in a military weapon. Of course, there is uh, uh, the, the use and the purpose is, uh, is different. But uh, this, uh, this was probably the most sensitive aspects of the secret nuclear program that was officially revealed just after Brazil's democratization that happened in 1985. Uh, said that, so there was a major accomplishment uh, from this autonomous nuclear program that was the mastery of uh, uranium enrichment technology. And given that uh, the main question is, uh, what was the final purpose of Brazil? It was uh, nuclear energy was useful for providing uh, energy uh, for a booming economy, how was the case uh, in the 70s, or oh, there were also other purposes. Professor Yoko um, uh, mentioned the mix uh, uh, existing about civilian and military purposes, and uh, uh, citing also um, Bertrand uh, Goldschmidt that talked about a nuclear complex sometimes is not very clear how we can differentiate from peaceful and military purposes. So the main thing talking about in a, in a, in a forum of non-proliferation studies is there was any project for a Brazilian, for a Brazilian bomb or the uh, Brazilian nuclear program, the, 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 ultimate, uh, the ultimate aim was uh, reaching uh, nuclear autonomy just for peaceful purposes. We have uh, very little evidence of uh, uh, possible war uses by Brazil, but we know that there were uh, intentions for the future or to leave the door open for the possibility in the future to develop nuclear devices. Uh, we can note it uh, since the beginning, since uh, in 1953 there were uh, tests uh, in major research centers in the army for an implosion bomb. Uh, and uh, there is just this piece of evidence without any kind of justification of this kind of test, of any kind of political justification about those tests. Just to mention that in 1951, Argentina has uh, uh, announced that uh, uh, it, it was able to master thermonuclear uh, reactions. Uh, it was uh, an announcement that, it was that has been dismantled almost immediately. But we don't know if uh, it had any repercussion on Brazil. And uh, the other thing that's important is uh, that in the middle of the negotiation of the NPT, the Brazilian program set up uh, during the military regime, the Brazilian, the Brazilian president uh, um, approved a, nuclear, a new nuclear policy that, had, as, uh, that also had uh, among its goals also the 
preservation of the right for peaceful nuclear explosions. That also one of the main obstacles to Brazil's acceptance of the NPT in 1968. So it's interesting uh, that uh, Brazil defended it right, uh, and uh, it talked also about uh, we have to uh, sell to the world the idea that uh, we will uh, uh, develop uh, things that uh, can explode, but we will never call them bombs. Uh, but uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, a sort of irony from, uh, from his declaration. But uh, I mean, during the 60s, uh, there was this kind of justification around the world. It didn't mean that uh, there were projects for, for a bomb. The only evidence we had in uh, an oral history interview with uh, one member of the Brazilian National Security Council of the early 80s is that there was a proposal in 1984, uh, a not so serious proposal according to, to, our, to, to, my, to, to the source, that uh, the Ministry of the Air Force, and they would like to underline that the Air Force was uh, responsible for the PNE project in the secret nuclear project, uh, submitted to the cabinet a proposal to uh, develop and explode a nuclear device by 1985. It was conceived as a sort of firework, of big firework at the very end of the military regime for celebrating the military regime. Of course, the decision was discarded because of the possible international repercussions and also because of the uh, building of a new relationship uh, with, uh, with Argentina uh, in, uh, in the early 80s. And the final word of, uh, uh, on uh, having or not a bomb was given by President Fernando Collor Gimelo in 1990, he was the first uh, president elected by general elections after the military regime with the election of 1989, who in September 1990, uh, decided to fly to the Air Force in Saradu Kashimbo, where the press announced that there were nuclear test shafts, and it decided to close them. You, in, the, in, the, in this picture, you can see the way it closed, the, the spectacular way it closed the, the test shafts that actually were exploded by the military just two years later in 1992. But there was this gesture was, of course, part of the rhetoric, but was also very important because it coincided also with uh, the decision to put all the military projects under the civilian supervision and without uh, uh, black funding. So that was the case uh, of the existence of these projects for, uh, for a while. And, uh, the, the last thing I would like to talk about, of course, is what was the Brazilian position in the nuclear non-proliferation regime. Brazil, initially, during the final years of the democratic world from 1961 to 1964, was a promoter of uh, disarmament and non-proliferation initiatives, at least at the governmental uh, level, at the diplomatic level. And here, important to see how Brazil can be um, conceived as a neutral country or a country that wanted to be neutralized from the tension of the Cold War. Because the first time Brazil proposed to set up a, nu a, a nuclear free zone in Latin America to denuclearize Latin America, it wasn't after the Cuban Missile Crisis, but it happened actually in 1961 during the in occasion of the UN General Assembly, when after the French tests in Algeria, it proposed to the UN um, to create a nuclear weapon free zone, both in Latin America and in Africa, in order to avoid the inclusion of those areas in the Cold War tension and above all to avoid a possible global, a possible nuclear vulnerability in those areas. So I think that uh, uh, quite interesting also for Pascal's uh, uh, project for understanding what was the role of Brazil in this, uh, uh, in, in this dialogue, in, in the whole uh, dialogue about the possible neutralization or nuclear neutralization in the, uh, during the, the Cold War. Of course, these proposals evolved after the nuclear missile crisis in Cuba, 
and it evolved uh, with the five presidents proposal of 1963 that began the negotiation for uh, the nuclear weapon free zone. But uh, things change in Brazil because not uh, everybody supported also during the democratic uh, rule this proposal because uh, this kind of proposal, the nuclearizing Brazil was seen as, uh, as a way to avoid a possible Brazilian nuclear nuclearization, also civilian nuclearization in the future. So the military regime also accepted this, uh, this kind of arguments that has been were, were elaborated during the democratic rule and decided, of course, to accept partially, let's say, the Latin American nuclear weapon free zone because uh, uh, it actually took part to the zone just uh, in 19, starting from 1994. And Brazil began in 1968 a long opposition to the NPT because it considered and it still considers the treaty discriminatory and uh, uh, it considers that uh, the superpowers are not actually committed to disarmament. And of course, in that right moment, because uh, it wanted to preserve the right to develop peaceful nuclear explosions, like explosives like the rest of the of the nuclear full cycle without uh, strong international constraints. Uh, it also it's connected to the need that we see since uh, uh, the 40s to avoid strict safeguards to Brazilian nuclear facilities or future nuclear nuclear facilities. But things changed with the end of the Cold War and with the change also in Brazil. After the Brazil mastered the nuclear fuel cycle, of course, the condition was another one. Brazil already mastered the nuclear fuel cycle and uh, uh, could uh, have uh, another posture, of course, uh, towards uh, another attitude towards non-proliferation nodes. And for this reason also that Brazil found its, uh, its own way to join and to accept non-proliferation nodes. The first step is, of course, the deepening of the relationship with Argentina after the Brazil renounced and closed the shafts in 1990. Uh, there were proposals that the Argentinians accepted. There was already a very rich uh, um, dialogue between the two countries that started actually in 1985. Uh, and that the two countries decided to create a bilateral system of uh, uh, common inspection of control and account of nuclear materials. So it led exactly 30 years ago to the creation of, the, of a bilateral agency, non-proliferation agency, we can say, between Brazil and Argentina, the Brazilian-Argentine uh, agency for control and account of nuclear materials, the so-called ABACI. And uh, the two countries decided to uh, renounce to the rights to develop nuclear explosives. And in 1991, as we can see in the pictures, we can see President, uh, the recently um, passed away President Carlos uh, Melen from, uh, from Argentina, uh, in the middle, President Fernando Colo di Mello and Dr. Hans Blix uh, from the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, when in that moment, 1991, Brazil accepted full scope safeguards uh, to, their, to its nuclear activities. Both Brazil and Argentina also for keeping the balance between the two countries and for having, uh, of course, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, of course, this uh, uh, agreement uh, allowed Brazil to have uh, a special status of inspection, inspections made by this binational agency and also the external collaboration and external inspection with, by the, the International Atomic Energy Agency. It's important also here to understand that this new unique model relied also on the Japanese model that adopted, adopted uh, the exapartheid uh, agreement uh, in the early 80s, above all for um, for the supervision and the inspections of uh, uh, enrichment facilities. So it was uh, a model also in this, uh, uh, during those, uh, those negotiations. And the last step, of course, in 19, between 1994 and 1998 was uh, accepting the rest of the norms. The uh, accepting uh, full scope safeguards 
uh, guaranteed to Brazil to the possibility to accept uh, and to be included in the Tlatelolco Treaty. Uh, but uh, uh, the last step, of course, for accepting all the nuclear non-proliferation norms, despite strong, a strong opposition, a strong internal opposition in Brazil and also within the foreign ministry was accepting the NPT that was signed in 1997 by President Fernando Henrique Cardoso and accepted in 1998. It's interesting that the person who signed the treaty, the foreign minister who signed the treaty, also participated during his whole life, uh, uh, during the beginning of his uh, diplomatic career in, all the, in the negotiations for uh, opposing the NPT in the Geneva and New York negotiations. And it's also interesting that accepting the NPT actually followed the plan that the Brazilians uh, had in mind uh, during the mid 70s. If we had actually the possibility to master the nuclear fuel cycle, if we are considered nuclear capital countries, why not accepting uh, entering the nuclear supplies groups and why not accepting also non-proliferation norms? Because we can get in the, the, the regime as a nuclear capable state and uh, we will not have other constraints. This was uh, the rationale of the 70s. So the decision of the 90s, we can consider that uh, followed a little bit the, the rationale of, uh, of the 70s above all for the new status Brazil had over the, the 90s. Of course, Brazil uh, manifested and still manifests is, uh, is, uh, shows its full criticism against the discriminatory nature of the NPT. And above all, Brazil in that moment declared at the moment, moment of ratification that it would not accept uh, most intrusive norms until effective steps by the uh, nuclear weapon states towards disarmament. This is why Brazil still opposes the additional protocol today. And uh, uh, the additional protocol to international safeguards agreement. This, uh, sorry for. And the last, uh, my last slide before uh, our discussion, our Q and A, is uh, understanding what's the the role of Brazil today in the global nuclear order. Uh, Brazil doesn't have a very large nuclear sector. Uh, it of course masters uh, sensitive technologies, uh, ma still masters uh, uranium, uh, the uranium enrichment technology in the Navy research centers, but uh, it has just an activity too. Nuclear, nuclear power plants. And the, the third one that was the second one of the West German nuclear deal is still under construction and there is no date for its completion. The other important aspect, of course, is the possible mid reuse of, uh, of nuclear energy for novel propulsion. That's, uh, of course, uh, uh, respected by the international community and uh, uh, thanks to an agreement with France of 2008, Brazil will have in the future, can have in the future, a nuclear power summary. So respecting also a very old uh, um, ambition of Brazil that uh, we can uh, track back to the mid 70s and to that autonomous nuclear program. But Brazil today, or at least uh, until a few day, uh, years ago, until 10 years ago, was uh, quite uh, critical against the global nuclear order. And uh, it tried, uh, along with, uh, with, with uh, Turkey, to be a bridge between the nuclear weapon states of the US and Iran to solve the Iranian nuclear crisis with the so-called De Tehran Declaration Swap uh, uh, Agreement of uh, May 2010. And Brazil is still one of the main critical, as is still a critical voice, or until 2018 was a critical voice of the unfair nature of the non-proliferation regime. Brazil has been, uh, has been one of the main promoters of the, uh, test ban of the nuclear weapon ban treaty in 2017. But uh, we can consider that uh, right now has not yet ratified the treaty that uh, is, uh, is in force. So uh, the book uh, finishes his uh, narrative in uh, 19, uh, um, in 2018, of course, but the situation is not very clear still today about its uh, attitude towards the, uh, this, uh, this kind of treaty. 
thank you very much. Uh, I I will uh, very I will be very happy to have uh, a lot of questions from uh, from the audience and from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlo, for a fascinating presentation. Thank you.